Welcome to the Vineyard Church Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. For more information on this podcast or other resources, go to vineyardlive.us. To learn more about us, go to the vineyardchurch.us. Well, at the heat of the day, several million Israelites crowded together, straining to peer across the Jordan River and get a glimpse of unfamiliar territory. This was their moment. They'd waited their whole lives for today. Forty years earlier, their their fathers and mothers had failed to trust God, had failed to believe that he was going to bring them into everything that he had promised, and as a result, they'd spent year upon year taking laps in the desert. But the day had finally come. They were going to cross the River Jordan and enter into the promised land. And as they stood there looking, a curious mixture of emotions began to come up in them. At first, enthusiasm, excitement, passion. This is what God has been working towards our whole lives. What lies ahead? But then shortly thereafter, a little bit of insecurity, a little bit of uncertainty. We've never seen that side of the river before. And, you know, our, our ancestors, they turned away because there were giants. What if they're still there? And, you know, for my whole life, this guy Moses has been leading, but now he passed the baton to Joshua. We've never followed him. It was a, a dynamic and exciting moment of stepping into destiny. And that moment is the context for the book of Deuteronomy. I don't know if you've ever read that book. It's kind of a a recap as the Israelites are right on the edge of stepping into God's promises. And in a sense, it's actually the context of where you and I are at as a church family. At the border of 2017, our senior leaders, Hap and I, they stood up and they said, you know, this is the year that God is bringing us across the River Jordan into our own promised land. And like the Israelites, we probably fear a mixture of feelings, enthusiasm, excitement, and uncertainty. What does it mean to enter into the promised land? What does it mean for us as a church family, and what does it mean for each of us personally? Well, in Deuteronomy 28, Moses gives the Israelites a little bit of a heads up as to what's going to be coming for them. And I think that his, uh, his uh, warning is too strong of a word to say. His encouragement of what's ahead is probably helpful for us to hear as well. He says, this is what entering the promised land means. This is what it actually looks like. And it's true, not just for the Israelites in that time, but I think this tells us what our own journey into the promised land can be expected to look like as well. In Deuteronomy 28, it says this, The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you if you keep his commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity, in the fruit of your womb, the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, within the land the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow." And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail, and you shall only go up and not down if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. Moses, at the border of the promised land, gives the Israelites a a clue, a heads up. Here's what's to come. And he tells them to expect three things. The first, I think, is really interesting because it's not what I think of when I think of the promised land. And he says, the first thing to expect is battle. 
expect that you're going to have enemies that are going to come out to meet you and you're going to battle. But the Lord's going to meet you in that battle and where your enemies may have come out united, they're going to scatter in all different directions. The second thing he says is abundance. The Lord's going to bless your fields. He's going to bless your offspring. He's going to bless your barns and you're going to have more than enough of the things, of the supply that the Lord will give to you. And this is usually what we think of when we think of the promised land, right? A, a, a land flowing with milk and honey, which if you think about it, it's kind of a gross picture, like milk streams, like honey pools, gross, right? <laughs> a land flowing with milk and honey, abundance, more than enough. And the last thing he says is this, influence. You're going to be the head, not the tail. You're going to go up and not down. In fact, other nations will actually fear you. Battle, abundance, influence. This is what entering the promised land looks like. And while the Israelites had a context in that time, we can experience and expect those same things in our own journey into the promised land. Battle against the enemy. Abundance in our own lives. And influence with others. And you know... When we think of the promised land, we tend to think of the middle one, abundance, but not one in three. But the deal is this, they all come as a package deal. You can't get abundance without battle and influence. They all come together. And so in our journey into the promised land, we have a journey of learning how to step into a mindset that includes all of these. You know, there's a, there's a mindset that's effective for battle. It's a mindset I believe actually the Lord wants to grow us in. Kingdom warriors against the enemy. I spent a, a, a decent period of my life training people in full contact martial arts. And there's a mindset that you train people to be able to, to take because there's going to come a time where they're going to square off against someone whose goal is to hurt them so much they can't get back up again. And that requires a certain kind of mindset. It requires a certain kind of determination it requires a certain amount of self-control, not to let your mind spin out among the zillion paths it could go that would be unhelpful. And it requires being able to control yourself in a situation of pressure. You can always tell someone who doesn't have this mindset because with the first good hit, they get angry and they go out of control. Actually, I see a lot of believers do that same thing. First good hit from the enemy, they get out of control. Not only is there a mindset of warrior, a mindset of battle. There's a mindset of abundance. And the Lord's been working with us already on that this year. We did a, a series um, a couple of months ago called A Generous Life, where we explored the abundance mindset and God's uh, plan for bringing us into abundance in our own lives. Wonderful series. But it's the last one. It's influence and the perspective of influence that I want to talk about today. You know, in the kingdom, God wants to take you and me and bring us into positions of influence. It's an odd thing. We enter the kingdom by choosing to lay down influence in our own lives. By choosing to adopt the posture of a servant and to say, God, you're God, I'm not, I submit to you. I give up control. I give up influence. I yield to you. And in our journey in the kingdom, we ought to stay in that same posture of servanthood our entire journey. But what happens is the Lord begins to bring influence back to us for others, not for ourselves. He wants to give us as much influence as we don't need. As much influence as we don't need. It doesn't go to our head. We're not impressed with it. We don't really begin to take ourselves seriously because of the level of influence we have. God wants to use us to affect the world around us. In 1 Kings 3, we see an interesting uh, situation. Solomon has just been given the throne of his father David. And David and Solomon were kind of the highlight, they were the pinnacle of Israel's history, of Israel's culture, and Israel's kingdom. And at the time that Solomon has stepped in to try and fill his father David's shoes, we see this interesting encounter. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, ask what I shall give you. So, so Solomon goes to Gibeon, the Lord shows up to him in a dream and gives him a blank check. What do you want? That was a pretty cool deal, right? Anyone else ever wanted that, <laughs> right? Sign me up for that one, God. 
And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David, my father. Although I am but a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. Now, he's not literally a little child at this point. He's expressing, this is what I feel like. I feel like I'm a kid trying to fill a grown-up shoes. Don't know how to go out or come in. I don't know how to carry myself with this much influence, he's saying. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this? Your great people. Solomon is saying, God, you've put me in a place where I don't have the capacity to fill the influential position you've put me in. I saw my father David do it. I saw what it was like for him to reign as king. I saw the influence that he could have. I don't have that, God. I need your help. I need you to give me wisdom and discernment. I need you to grow me to appropriately fill the level of influence you've given me. And if you read the rest of the story, God shows up and says, hey, you know, I'm really blessed. You could have asked for a long life. You could have asked for riches. You could have asked for victory over your enemies. But instead, you ask for the ability to appropriately influence in the place I've given to you. And so I'm going to give you the whole package deal. You're going to get all of those. He's blessed. He's honored by that. And I believe we're in a time, we're in a season, because we're crossing into the promised land where God is going to take each and every one of us on our own version of that journey. God wants to bring each and every one of us into positions, into places of influence, and we need to learn to grow to fill those places of influences, to grow to be able to, to um, fill that place in such a way where we live up to it. It doesn't crush us, it doesn't overwhelm us, but we know how to take that place appropriately. That's part of our kingdom journey. We've been on this journey for a number of years, and, and I think it's a journey that's going to be both for our church as a whole and for us each individually as well. So let's look at both of those in turn. The last five to seven years in our church have been dynamic. I'll put it that way. It's been exciting. It's been fun. It's been at times tumultuous. It's been up and down. And if you've been around for this journey, you know the only thing that's felt constant is change kind of waiting for whatever God's going to do next. And, you know, God has been doing that intentionally in the right timing. Now, um, the people who study social organizations, people who study companies, corporations, churches, you know, nonprofits, neighborhoods, you know, stuff like that, they say that every 30 to 40 years, a social institution needs to rediscover and reinvent itself, or it's going to begin to go stale. Great example of this is um, the way Volkswagen reinvented their classic car, the VW Bug, right? Back in the 60s, Volkswagen had this crazy idea. Rather than designing another big boaty car that like the 60s was full of, Volkswagen decided to go the other way. They were going to make this small, round, interesting looking car. And it was this total like game changer. It was like, wow, nobody's made a car like that before, right? And so it became this iconic car, the bug, right? We even have games that we do, punch bug, right? You see a bug, you hit somebody, it's a, it's a thing, right? Well, that was in the 60s. And back in the last 10 to 15 years, Volkswagen realized that that idea is still a good idea, but it's getting stale. We need to reinvent it. We need to recontextualize it for now. And so they took the same idea, they dusted it off, and they reapplied it into today's market, into today's values, into today's perspective. And you can see the two of them side by side there. It's amazing. They're completely different cars, and they're the same exact car. Aren't they? It's the same exact essence. It's that you look at them and you go, oh yeah, they're the same. Like, of course, they fit together. They belong, right? Because it's got that same essence. It's got that same DNA. And yet, they're totally different. Unless you're like a classic car dude, like the one on the right, it looks old. I don't want to drive that thing. 
I'm going to look like I'm out of date, right? But the one on the left, I'm like, man, that's a slick looking car. Sign me up for that one. I like that. I'd jump in that thing. I'd cruise around, right? What is it? It's the same idea, but it's contextualized for the now. It's relevant for the now. And if Volkswagen hadn't have done this, we'd all laugh at the VW bugs. We'd go, ah, what a stupid idea. People did weird things in the 60s, right? We wouldn't think of it as a modern thing. We wouldn't think of it as something that fits now. But because they took the, the DNA, they took the essence, and it's been updated, we go, oh, that's a cool car. That fits for today. God's been taking our church on that same journey. God's been taking the DNA that was deposited now 40 years ago this year and dragging that into the present day and saying, let's dust that off. Let's recontextualize it. Let's look at how that fits for today with today's society, today's communities, today's need. How does that work? And so we've been on that journey for the last five to seven years. That's what God's been doing. That's why it feels like things are changing all the time. Because God's saying, okay, well, let's, let's straighten out that line. Let's change the engine this way. Let's move the wheels up a little bit or whatever it is. And it's looked like a lot of things. He's updated our message. For 30 years, we preached the message of the kingdom of God. And we're still preaching that message. But he's added elements of identity and grace and other things that have been exciting and dynamic. He's been drawing out with clarity who we are as a church. As we come to understand our mission with new clarity, we're here to change the world with Jesus, to change the world with Jesus. And we do it. How do we do it? We've been understanding that better by being a missional people. We were missional leaders that carry supernatural breakthrough. We establish a culture of excellence and we do it together as a tribe. It's been coming into clarity. Leadership has been turning over. There's been new faces on the staff, and that's a change. For the first 25 years of the church, faces didn't turn over much. But God's been retooling, reinventing the church for the next, you know, 30 to 40 year stretch. That's what he's been doing. And along that journey, he's been intentionally increasing our influence. Let me just give a a couple of things to just draw this out. This, This may not be something we necessarily hit, but if you step back and you look at not the trees, but the forest, you'll see it. For 30 years, our church was defined as a group of people that met in Urbana, Illinois. Now you can't say that anymore. We don't just meet in Urbana, Illinois. We meet in Urbana, and we meet in Sullivan, and we meet in Muhammad, and we meet in Bloomington, and we may meet in a whole bunch of other communities around the corner. We've become geographically distributed, and we're having influence in a greater number of communities as a result. God's birthed a... um, Uh, conferences out of our church. We've got a a More Love, More Power conference series, which has been a wonderful thing in our church. There's some photos from our uh, conference in this last March. We've had 7,500 attendances at these conferences. People that have come here. Now, some of them are from our church. Many of them are from the Capital C Church, outside of our church. And that's to say nothing of thousands of people that have participated online. It's over 10,000 people that God has put deposits in through these conferences, influence. God birthed this interesting thing called School of Kingdom Ministry. We weren't necessarily even really planning to do this, but we started a a class and other churches began to come to us and say, hey, we're interested in this, this cool Holy Spirit ministry training class. Can we run the program? And so this is our sixth year. Actually, this is graduation week this week for School of Kingdom Ministry. And it's hard for us, it's hard for us to actually get a sense of how significant this is influencing the Capital C Church. The picture you see right there, that's our Urbana graduating class last year, okay? That's a good number of people, but here's the thing you got to realize. That's 10% of the students last year. 90% of the students were not from our church, 90% were scattered across 60-some-odd churches all across the country as we trained more than 1,000 students last year. After this weekend, we're going to be, I don't know, up over 2,300-some-odd students or whatever. The influence that God is granting us. I went to a School of Kingdom Ministry site this last week. I just happened to be there. I walk in the door, and they've got, like, documents that we just hand out to the students. Like, hey, here's a handout or whatever. They've got those framed on the walls of the church. The influence we're having is remarkable. 
By the way, just because I can, if you've been a part of School of Kingdom Ministry, student now, leader, student in the previous, would you just stand up right now at every auditorium? Because I know we've got, at every campus we have people, right? Look at these people. Now, if you're graduating student or leader this year, would you just wave if you're part of this year or part of the graduating class this year? That's awesome. Congratulations. And I know we have graduating in Sullivan and in Muhammad this year too. Thanks. That's amazing, guys. These guys and gals, they're choosing to give up extra time, extra energy, extra money to say, I want to influence well. I want to be trained to influence. I want to be trained to extend the kingdom. It's amazing. Beyond that, did you know that our services no longer happen just in our uh, auditoriums anymore? Right on the other side of that camera right now is Vineyard Live, and there's people watching both right now, and they'll turn it, tune in and watch the recording from all over the country all week long. In fact, beyond our country. We've had people from you know, South Korea and Africa and all these different places, right? What's happening here is spreading. God's opening a new door with influence right now, actually, uh, in the realm of publishing. In the last year, uh, Dai has published two books titled We're Pregnant, a title, not an announcement, and <laughs> Hello, Holy Spirit, Okay. <laughs> These are messages that God has been birthing in her for 30 plus years. And now there's a platform to share that in a bigger and a broader way. Just because I'm up here and I can say this, I'll also announce, I haven't said this to the church, but I'm publishing a book this fall. It's called Live Like Jesus. It's up on, <clears throat> it's up on Amazon right now. You can pre-order it if you want. If you pre-order it, it's like half price just about, so I'd suggest that. Um, it's coming out with chosen books. It'll be a cool deal. It's about identity. So if you like that, check that book out. But here's the moral of the story. God is taking us as a family and increasing our influence. And we all have the opportunity to participate in that if we want to. But it looks like us changing our perspective and our paradigm on what church is. So here's a rule of thumb. Every increasing level of influence you step into things have to become less and less about you. Every increasing level of influence, things have to become less and less about you. And so there's an invitation for you to begin to change your relationship with this church and to see yourself as, I'm part of a church that's changing the world and I want to be part of that. This isn't about me coming to church to fill myself up anymore. This is about me joining a church where God is doing something that's influencing the world and I want to be a part. And if you choose to, there's plenty of creative ways that you can be a part of that. Maybe buy one of Ty's books and mail it to a friend who might need it. Maybe communicate with people, hey, there was this wonderful message or worship or whatever, check out the Vineyard Live link. Maybe you invite some friends to attend one of our conferences and you host them to make it easier for them to come. There's all kinds of different ways that you can choose to be a part of what God is doing with our family as a whole. But you know, it's not just about our church family. It's also about our lives individually. The grace that God is putting on our church family, he's also giving to each one of us. And God wants to use you and I and send us into the places and the positions that we already have influence and use those to extend the kingdom of God. This room is filled with people that are employed or involved with all kinds of spheres outside the church, right? We've got people that attend school in here. Everybody has some kind of a home, life, neighborhood community. We've got people with just an assortment of all kinds of different jobs, right? Any, any job you can think of is in one of our auditoriums right now, right? And each one of those are places that we're sent to be on mission. We've already been given influence there, and God wants to use that position to allow us to influence that realm. It's brilliant. God has sent each and every one of us to be a missionary, and for most of us, he has someone else pay for it. You get a paycheck from the company that you're sent as a missionary to. That's what's actually happening, by the way. You might think that you're going there and you're working for the man and they're giving you a paycheck. That's what the rest of the world is doing, okay? You're a servant of the Lord first. So you go there to serve the Lord and the Lord pays you to occupy and to serve in that mission space. God wants to take us, I believe, and raise us up in greater levels of influence in the places he already has us. 
What does that mean? What does that look like? Well, I'll share a, a few thoughts. Um, and, and a lot of these have come from my own journey, honestly, of growing and influence myself and learning to be stretched into a new place. First thought is this. Get the basics down. Influence falls apart when we don't have the capacity to hold up the weight of the influence we've been given. Every level of influence and every level of leadership comes with a, a, a weight and intensity and a pressure. And what will happen is if you don't have the basics down, if your character isn't in place, if you haven't dealt with the way that you relate to other people, if you haven't learned to get a solid connection with Jesus that fills you up and gives you what you need for the day, if you don't have those things in place, that weight will crack you where you're weak and you'll crumble. The Lord's favor will bring you into positions of influence, but it's weak character that takes us out. That's a word for some of us. The Lord's favor will bring us into positions of influence, but it's our weak character that can take us out. Get those basics in place. If you have a place in your life where you're, you're struggling to get alignment with the kingdom, you've got an issue that, that isn't the way that Jesus would have you be living, get connected to a community, get prayer, get a mentor. Whatever you need, work on that. Because that won't just go away when influence comes. There will be added pressure that will come to that. Number two, spend some time reflecting and discovering the message that God has given you. Each and every one of us, we're living a story out. We're living a journey out. And what God wants to do is he wants to take the ways that he's been real in our lives and use that to influence other people. Who God has been to you, he wants to be through you. Who God has been to you, he wants to be through you. But that requires intentionality to participate. It requires you stepping back and saying, hold on, who actually has been God to me? What has he actually been in my life? How have I actually experienced God? Not just as an idea, not just as a teaching, not just as, as something I'm supposed to believe. What has been real in my life? Because what has been real in your life is where you carry spiritual authority to be able to speak to. And people will listen. I remember seeing and experiencing that when I was a grad student at U of I. Here I'm, I'm a grad student. And I'm giving my advisor, who's an established professor, his wife is an established professor, they're both tenured, I'm giving him life advice and he's listening to me. Why? Because God's established something in me. The spiritual authority, people will hear it and defer to it without even realizing they're doing it. What has God done in your life? Who has he been to you? Thirdly, each and every one of us have areas where <clears throat> we have characteristics or traits that will trend towards influence and characteristics or traits that will undercut influence. Work on your weak spots that will undercut influence. Example, when we first get started in any area of influencing, you know, maybe you're new in the faith. Maybe you're new in a position of leadership. We almost all start with a tremendous amount of passion and energy and enthusiasm and zeal. And that's good. And that will open influence. We'll, people will tend to follow passion and zeal. They've got something I don't have. I want that. But what you don't have, probably, is wisdom and experience and perspective. And so one of those will gain influence and the other has the opportunity to undercut it. Find someone who does have wisdom, experience, and perspective. Begin to learn from them. Begin to draw off them. Begin to get input from them. Hey, what did I do well? What didn't I do well? I can't tell you how much I've learned from our senior leaders, Happy and Die, in this journey where you know, I've stepped in with a ton of zeal, passion, ah! And they're like, oh, buddy, it's a little much sometimes. You know, <laughs> like, that, that part was good, but let's tweak that part, right? And if, I don't, if I'm not allowing them to speak into that, then I'm just being thick-headed. They're just working for my benefit. Here's another one. Sometimes in life, um, our lives can get awful full fast, can't they? I was talking with my wife the other day. We've got three young kids. You know, I, I work here. She's got our, her music studio. There's a lot going on. And it's very easy for us to get to the point where our life is living us and we're not living our life. Where we're not becoming intentional, where we're not keeping the focus we need to keep to be able to live our life towards a mission. 
Here's a news flash. If you don't set your life towards a mission, all the voices that will clamor for your attention will bring you away from it. You have to say no to the things that are a distraction. And, and some of us need to grow in being proactive in our life. There's a lot of things that really don't matter. There's still expectations on you. There's still things people will ask of you, but they're not actually important. Learn to live life with focus. Here's another one, last one. As we learn and grow and as we uh, uh, live in positions of influence over the long haul, here's what can happen. Our vision can get lowered to what's realistic. We start saying God can do anything. All things are possible to him who believes. Jesus himself said it. This is going to be incredible. And then we eventually find ourselves, well, this is how it actually works. This is what's actually doable. What do you have? You have the wisdom of experience. Absolutely. You know how to, how to navigate things, how to get things done. But maybe faith or hope has taken a hit or two down. It's probably something the Lord would want to bolster back up. We all have places where we can learn to grow in our influence. Be proactive about that. Here's the, here's the truth with that. Your strengths will not make up for your weaknesses there. You can't focus on your strength in influencing other people and expect that to erase your weakness. That's an area where it doesn't work that way. You need to shore up your, your weaknesses. I believe God's bringing us into a time, into a season, where he's going to be bringing us into more and more influence. I was talking to God the other day a little bit about just the state of our culture. I don't know if you guys feel this way, but to me it just seems so obvious that the entirety of our culture, the entirety of our nation is sprinting headlong into the plan the enemy has for us. You look at any area of our culture, any area of our society, I mean, it's, it's not just a walk, it's a sprint towards the enemy's plan. And I was talking to God about that. And I was like, God, I don't like that. You know, like, come on, like Jesus is king. The enemy's not king. You know, what's going on? And this is what I felt the Lord say to me. He said, Putty, here's what you got to know. The enemy can only drive culture when the church leaves him a vacuum to do so. The enemy can only drive our nation when the church leaves a vacuum for him to do so. How do I know that? All authority on earth belongs to Jesus. Therefore, it's the body of Christ's to take. And when the church lets go of the reins, when the church becomes passive, when the church becomes afraid to influence the way that we're supposed to influence, the enemy will step right on in there. He will take advantage of that. But that is not the way the Lord wants this thing to go down. Jesus said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So go, do something about it. In other words, step into that. And God's going to take you and me, he's going to take us, and he's going to put us in those positions of influence so we can be influencers to the rest of society. The church is not meant to run society, but we're supposed to influence society. We're supposed to set the tone and the timber. We're supposed to um, set the direction of the course of things. That's our job. Jesus said in Luke 13, he's like, hey, here's how the kingdom works. I'm just going to find it real quick. I'm passionate. I need to get to the scripture. Do, do, do. Hey, buddy, learning thing. Open the Bible before you say the scripture. <clears throat> to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. All right, this is a weird passage. What does this mean? Was well, anybody ever done one of those like starter breads, you know, like friendship bread or Amish bread? You get this weird packet of goo. And you need this weird packet of goo to make the bread, right? And you take the packet of goo and you add a bunch of flour and whatever. And if you're smart, you'll make another one so you can duplicate it or however that all works. Well, that weird packet of goo is basically leaven. It's this mixture of yeast and, and other such things. And you need that to turn the flour into bread. And what Jesus is saying is this. You and I, the church, we're God's starter packet for his plans for the rest of the world. We're supposed to be buried in the rest of the world, influencing, setting the tone, releasing the kingdom out there that we get to experience together in here once a week. But God set it up so that we spend an hour in here, getting filled back up, getting excited so that we can go out there and spend 100 hours a week pouring it into culture and into society. And Jesus says that the task is that the leaven leavens the whole lump. 
That the kingdom that we get to experience, we go and we release into every realm of society. God wants us to be influencers. He wants us to be bringing the kingdom to our neighborhoods, to our workplaces, to our schools. He wants us to be bringing the kingdom to our families, to our government, to our health care, to our education, to every other sphere I can't think of right now. What does that mean? What does that look like? I don't know entirely, but I know that this is part of what crossing the border into the promised land looks like. There's going to be battle against the enemy. There's going to be abundance that we get to experience in our own lives, and there's going to be influence that we get to learn to carry for the lives of others. That's the journey God has given us. Let's step into being the leaven of the kingdom. Pray with me. Jesus, I thank you that you have called us, Lord, to mission. You've called us to a task, God. You haven't just saved us and left us here, God, but you've called us to step in, Lord, to be the leaven that leavens the lump of the rest of the world. And God, I just pray like Solomon prayed, Lord, would you grow us so that we can, we can sit in that seat of influence effectively, Lord, would you shore up whatever needs to be shored up in us? Would you help us identify what you're doing in our lives? God, would you do these things so that we can be, God, the influence, the leaven that you want us to be? I thank you, God, that we get to experience that, God, all together as a family. And I thank you that we get to experience that individually in our own lives as well. Jesus, bring us into everything you have for us. Bring us into everything you have for us. We just say yes, God. We don't know what all it means. We don't know what all it looks like. But we say yes because you're Lord and we follow you. Lord, I thank you that you always set the model for us. You go first. You're the greatest influencer history has ever known. Lord, let us be models of you. Let us be Christians, people that Christ lives in. As you continue to influence culture and our world through us. In your name and for your kingdom's sake, amen. Thanks for listening to the message today. To experience more powerful messages, go to vineyardlive.us or join our Vineyard Live Plus community to view conferences, trainings, and special teachings.